Hopefully everyone had a great Thanksgiving. We did. We had 19 at the house, and it was so good seeing everybody, and it was so good when they left. So, just kidding, sort of. Um, it, you know, some families, when they get together, they have what I call Norman Rockwell moments, where everything is perfect, and everyone's dressed right, and everyone's on their best behavior, and everything goes as planned. And then there's kind of the rest of us that have Clark W. Griswold moments. So, same setting. We click to the next slide there. Maybe we'll get Clark up here. All right, there we go. Yeah, so uh, we, we have this, this is more reality. So what I want you to do is take a moment and share. Uh, we'll stand and meet and greet those around you and stand. Is your family more like the Norman Rockwell moments or the Clark W. Griswold moments? And maybe share one thing you're, th- you're thankful for. Let's stand and greet those around us. Let's take our seats. As we're getting started this morning, uh, as you guys know, our disaster relief team has been very active and uh, going through some different trainings, but also going through some uh, some incredible opportunities down in Louisiana after the big hurricane came through there. And then Dave Brown had an opportunity to go up to the East Coast. I just want to interview him for just a moment uh, because you went as a part of a group of folks from different churches to go up and help after Sandy. So just kind of give us a couple minutes on, on what that experience was like going up there in New Jersey. How's that? Okay, good. Well, it was definitely a different experience going to the East Coast. We went with a group from Harvest Baptist Church and The Rock, and myself and Fernando Santoya from Twickenham here. Uh, it was different because when you go to disaster relief in the Alabama or in the southern states, people are very receptive. It was a little different in Atlantic City where we went because the people were fearful of outsiders. They were a little bit reluctant to uh, let people in. And it took a lot of effort just to uh, let them know that we're not there to take things from them. We're not there to ask for money. We're actually there just to help and help them get through this and really just to show them uh, some love. And probably the most difficult thing was just trying to to get through. And it actually took people from the uh, ministers from the church there to talk to the church members to open up their homes. To kind of set the example. Set the example through that. Now, in the area where you guys went, it was kind of the contrast of you've got the multi-million uh, dollar homes right there on the coast, and then also some other neighborhoods, but you guys weren't working on the, the luxury homes out. Just kind of describe the area where you were. We were actually staying in Ocean City, which is a nice uh, vacation community, really nice beach homes. Um, we were staying a little in there, but we were actually working in Atlantic City. In Ocean City, there was a lot of support there, both uh, professional from Surf Pro servers, a lot of volunteers. The Red Cross was there. The churches were active in, in helping people. But we went uh, across to another island, to Atlantic City. And you go to Atlantic City, the first thing you see is the real expensive uh, gambling hotels, the Taj Mahal, and all the expensive areas that are already up and running and operating. But then a few blocks away, it's kind of a different world. You see a lot of poverty. You see a lot of uh, known for crime, robberies, kind of a place you really wouldn't want to be after dark, and it was interesting when we drove in there, and you drove into these communities, you didn't see any volunteers, you didn't see all the help that was out there. You just see uh, some homeless people, you see people uh, walking around a bit, but everyone was pretty much sitting in their homes and not a lot of work being done. So it was really a, a huge contrast to the, uh, the two areas, and the people, uh, like I mentioned, were, were kind of fearful of outsiders, and, 
and it was uh, you know difficult uh, at first to uh, you know to get in there. But you guys concentrated your efforts really on three families. Is that correct? Yeah, we worked uh, three homes uh, over the weekend. Uh, these homes are for the most part attached homes, so they share common walls and and, and common roofs. And uh, and first walk in the homes, uh, most of these people uh, were evacuated mandatorily. But a few were fearful of the vandals and the looters and stuff, so they stayed in their homes. And uh, but it was really four or five days until they could get back in there. And the first home we went into, the uh, smell was really strong. The carpets were soaked. The, uh, uh, the water came in probably you know, three feet up to the, the drywall. And it really needed a, a lot of work. Now, you mentioned that uh, working here in the South is completely different. Were you able to break down some walls spiritually? I know that you had a prayer team that was circling and praying with folks as you guys were also doing some of the manual labor. Yeah, we worked with a group called Hope Force International, that's a faith-based organization. And not only do they have a lot of volunteers and different workers coming in, but they have people who are dedicated just to talking to the people, to share with them, sit down and pray with them, which we were able to do also. And it was just a great experience to see how they were opening up after the work started and they realized they were they're getting this help and that the workers were doing it joyfully. And, uh, and it really just kind of uh, opened their, uh, you know, their hearts and their minds to, to hearing the gospel and uh, to sharing their stories. And it was really kind of amazing to see how God was working uh, in this community as we started working some of these homes. And then the neighbors also started coming up and, uh, and, and talking to us and wanting to see if they could get help. And so we were able to collect that information and knowing we had a larger organization that we could get other groups to come and help them as well. So just pretty amazing how God was working through this. Okay, Dave, one, one last question because I have to make this fit into my lesson or the one why I brought you up. Um, when, when you're on vacation, you think a lot about where you're staying, what you're eating, what you'll be doing, or are you having fun? Contrast that with being on mission. How is that different about how you approach your lodging, your food, what you're doing? Um, just kind of tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think if you're on vacation on your own, you've laid out a really good plan. You know what you're going to do. You know what uh, food you're going to have. When you go on a trip like this to an unknown area, it really shows uh, you have to be reliant on others. We had to rely on others for where we were going to sleep, for what we were going to eat. You go there to serve, but in reality, you end up being served. We were always, you know, provided uh, you know, uh, great support in terms of the food. Even the people we were working in the homes, they brought us lunch, even though, uh, you know, obviously they were kind of a hardship for them to afford that. But they provided for us, the organization provided. It really just shows that um, if you go there and all our mission trips that we've gone to and the disaster relief, you know, God always works it out for us. He always gets us to the right place. He always provides everything we need. And he always uh, you know, teaches us a lesson about uh, who he is and the love he has for us. Awesome. Let's show our appreciation, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about someone else that was on mission. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 27. You know, I, I know this time of year that it's easy for us to think about Thanksgiving and the blessings that we have, and uh, definitely with. Um, the big spread of food there on, on the table, just our, the bountiful harvest that God has provided, and certainly our, our time with those we care about very much. But what about the rest of the year? Do you find yourself with that same outpouring of thanksgiving? Is it as easy for you to, to quickly pull up the ways that God ha has blessed us? And is there circumstances and situations and, and sometimes even minor annoyances and, and things that, that crop up that cause us to take a step back from that. It was not quite so easy for that Thanksgiving to just outpour from our hearts. Well, the, this morning I want us to focus in on Paul and some of the things that he went through um, and, and hopefully identify what I call three common thieves that rob us of joy in our thankful hearts. Well, as you turn to Acts chapter 27, uh, a lot has happened since last week in Acts chapter 2 with the birth of, of the fledgling congregation there in Jerusalem. And as it starts going out, um, it becomes, and as we go further and further into the book of Acts, it becomes less and less about Peter and John and the goings-on there in Jerusalem. Because persecution kind of drives these new Christians out. A lot of the apostles stay there in Jerusalem, 
But these new Christians are so excited about what God has done. And so we see it just continuing out through Samaria and, and Judea. And exactly what the Lord asked to, to take place, the great commission, the word, the gospel message is making its way and it's, it's going all over the world. And so in, in Acts chapter 27, we're going to see an incredible story about the, the person that it, it really becomes the turning point in the book of Acts and that is Saul. And Saul we're introduced to in Acts chapter 9 in his conversion on the road to Damascus. And in, in an instant, Saul goes from the principal persecutor to Paul, the primary proclaimer of the gospel, especially to the Gentile people. Well, just because uh, Saul, now Paul, ha- has, has made um, a, a faith decision and is following Jesus, that doesn't mean that his life is easier. In fact, it's much more difficult when he's aligned himself with the unpopular teachings of Jesus and, and the resistance of, of the Jews and also from the Gentile world as well, trying to keep the peace. His life goes through a series of, of trials and tribulations. After his second missionary journey, Paul is, is arrested for uh, kind of an uprising among the people, and he's put into prison. And, and as he goes there, he... He finally uh, goes on trial before Felix and then Festus and finally King Agrippa. And as he's talking with these different people, Paul is kind of left in prison for two years. He's, he's been kind of pulled out of his ministry and pulled off his game. And he's been sitting there for a while. And if anyone had an excuse for losing their joy and their thankful spirit, it should be Paul. He's given up everything. And he's, he's laid it all out. He's put his life on the line. And yet, he rots here in this prison. But finally, after this trial, it, it, things are going to begin to change. But it brings us to our first thief. And the first thief that I identified is life goes off script. You know, when I was in, in high school, I was invited by another family. Um, they, they had three children, and each of them got to invite a, a friend to go with them to Disney World. And it, this was a, a big deal I'd never been before. And I, I knew the trip would probably be different than the way we do vacation because my friend's mom was type A planner uh, to, to the max. And she had kind of told us that uh, we're not going to have a whole lot of free, free time on this trip. We've got everything scripted as to how things are going to go. And so we had a few days at the beach, and then we had three days at Magic Kingdom. So I was really excited. I'd never been. And uh, as I kind of went through this trip, I figured out she had spent more time in her guidebooks and with the travel agent than actually the time we spent in the parks. And so she had read all these different things, and she pulled out this map. Now, it was a large map that had been laminated, so she spent a lot of time on this. And she had three colored lines. Those are for each of the days, and she had kind of this grid map as to where we're going to go in Magic Kingdom. So I was like, okay. And uh, she had little uh, stickers of cameras of where we'd take pictures with the family. She had heard this was the spot. I'm like, really? Okay. And then she also had times out. We had to be uh, on the blue line at at 1028 by this point if we hope to get in all the rides and shows. We're kind of, you know, walking along like lemmings and uh, doing whatever she she told us to do. And, uh, of course, she had this all down. Uh, Things went fine on Thursday and Friday, but that was the tail end of our spring break. And ours was an early spring break coming from Texas. Uh, And then Saturday, things were dramatically different because everyone else got out. And so we had stayed up late on, on Friday night and watched the big fireworks show. So we slept in a little bit and had a big breakfast on Saturday morning. So we showed up, and the parking lot was jam-packed. In fact, I've never seen, even since, it, it is crowded as this day. And even though we had tickets, we walked up, and they said, we can't let you in because this rarely happens, but we have met maximum occupancy for Magic Kingdom. So we're like, what do we do? I said, well, we have this new park that has just opened up and it's kind of focused on science and technology of the world tomorrow. It's a place called Epcot Center. It just opened up, and so we knew nothing about it. And, you know, we were kind of listening to some of the things. We're like, well, that sounds pretty good. But my friend's mom says, but I don't have a plan. (laughs) And her husband kind of winked at us kids and says, well, I guess we'll just have to wing it. And so she was going to, you know, but it, it really turned out to be my favorite day. And so sometimes I, I think we're following after God. He's just going to say, even though you've got this plan of how life is going to be, <laughs> I'm going to throw you some curveballs, and you're going to have to, as Dave talked about, 
you're going to have to trust me and you're going to have to just wing it and allow me to, to lead you. You know, we buy into the idea that life is a series of ups and downs, but, you know, as, as followers of Christ, don't we kind of feel like we're entitled to a little bit better life? You know, that, you know, maybe the lows won't be quite as bad as people that, that don't know Jesus. Uh, but, man, the Scripture doesn't tell us that that's going to happen. And I, I don't really know where we buy into this line of thinking because everyone that's come into, in, into the, the story of Jesus, some big tragedy has taken place. The first person to proclaim his name, John the Baptist, well, he's been beheaded. We have the, the first deacon, Stephen, has been stoned. And, and, you know, we have Peter who's been in prison, and Paul has been flogged up to this point, and he's also been in prison. And so if, if we're expecting smooth sailing in life, I want to encourage you, run away from Jesus. Because when you align yourself with him, the world and, and those that don't want the world to change are, are going to draw a line and say, we're against you. And the more we proclaim Christ, the more scripture tells us, we've got to get ready. Because if we're on mission, there are people that don't trust us and people that don't trust what we're doing. In fact, Jesus tried to warn us in John 16 and verse 33. He said, in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I've conquered this world. You know, being with Jesus doesn't make the, the seas of life any smoother. But what it does do is it prepares us for the storms that we know will come in this life. Well, how does Paul handle adversity when things that, that he expects to happen, the Lord shuts that door and he sends him a different direction? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16 through 18, Paul states this. He said, folks, no matter what's happening, just be joyful always. And take time and just be in a constant prayer. Give thanks in all circumstances because you, you don't know how it's going to turn out. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, the, I, I, I'm embarrassed sometimes when the smallest things that kind of throw me off my game and can, can kind of mess up my world and, and stuff. Boy, that's something we have to get past. But we have to get to the point where we can't allow circumstances and situations to dictate our actions, our words, how we respond. We, we've got to be above some of life's uh, struggles and, and temptations. We, we've got to get to the point where others aren't controlling how we act and respond. Well, let, let's kind of re return to our story. So he's, he's gone before them, and, and as he's in trial, he kind of throws out there, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, and if I don't like the outcome of this court, I, 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 can, I can appeal to Caesar. And they're like, okay, that's done. We're not going to make a decision. To Caesar, you're going to go. And so a plan was put into motion. And little does Paul know, he's about to embark on a voyage of a lifetime. So you have Paul, and the scripture also mentions Aristarchus. And, and we also, it, it's described as we, so most likely Luke was along with the fellow prisoners as well. So the three of them are kind of lumped in and they, they hop on this boat that's, um, that's out of the port of Caesarea that's bound for Rome. And as, as you take a look at the map, you, you see that there's a, there's a brief stop at Sidon as they sail past Cyprus. And they start heading up, and they're, they're going along the coast there just south of, of Asia Minor. And then they, they end up uh, putting ashore at Myra in the province of Lycia. And there they change ships and, and hop on an Alexandrian grain vessel that's headed over for Rome. Well, what they're trying to do is they're heading east, uh, east against western prevailing winds, especially this time of year. They're strong. And so they, they try to go against it for a while and finally give up and start going south towards Crete. And so they, they go past the northeast tip of Crete. And with great difficulty, they continue on to the harbor of Fair Havens. And so they're, they're there, and they're kind of making this decision of go or no go on the journey. And, and Luke kind of mentions what's happening he said this is after the fast of the day of atonement which kind of puts this story in in the latter part of Sep september towards the first part of october well during this day and age and, and what's happening with, with the, sh the sea vessels at that time you know folks didn't head out past about mid-october all the way to march it was just too dangerous and so you got these folks going well should we stop here or should we keep going so paul kind of inter interjects himself into the conversation and uh, I say we not go. Let's just stay here. Um, and, and in fact, if you keep going, uh, the ship is going to come apart. You're going to lose all your cargo, and you'll probably lose the crew as well. 
well, the sea captain, knowing that he's insured by, by Caesar if he keeps going and delivering this grain, says, you know, we're, we're going to press on. Uh, you're, you're a prisoner. Go, go, go back down below. And so they start heading out. And so they're trying to make the Cretan town of Phoenix in winter there. So as they put out to sea, the text tells us there's this gentle breeze that kind of takes them out into the open waters. But as soon as they get out there, boy, they get hammered by a vicious nor'easter. And the captain and the crew battle these hurricane force winds that the text tells us. And they're swept way off course. And so you, you can't really see here, but it says storm over there. And there's this big circular spot. That's where it takes place. And they're out there, and there, there's no land to be found. And they're just getting uh, tossed back and forth. And so they're, they're out there, and the storm just ravages the vessels. And they even get ropes and try to wrap them underneath just to hold this thing together. And so the crew... These are not just casual sailors. Now, they, this is their job. They're scared to death. And they start jettisoning the cargo, doing all they can. And so that brings us to our second thief that, that kind of robs us of our joy and our thanksgiving. The second one is, is when life goes through storms. Life goes through storms. You know, we, we understand that we have to have a few rainy days, so we'll appreciate the sunny days. But what happens when they're big storms? What happens when life gets totally thrown off center? I think that storms can really take an impact on us when a, a couple of things take place. The first is when you have a, a truly intense storm. I've talked with couples that have lost a child. I've been with couples as their marriage has, is in the process of dissolving. I've been with families that have had to send a family member behind bars. What do you do with that when they're so intense? And what, what do you do when you have multiple crises that come up at one time? Will you get laid off from your job? Right as your transmission drops out in your car? Have, have, have you ever had multiple things happening? And you're like, okay, any one of these I can, I can hold on to, I can deal with, but when you start stacking these up, there's no way I can do it. I mean, students, you, you know what it's like in middle school and high school. You know, you have your, your teachers, and you know during their off period, they get together in the, in the break room, and they say, how can we make Kenton's life or, or someone else's life just miserable? How, how can we, his mom's a teacher, so that probably was a bad example, but she and your dad get together. How can we make his life evil? Okay, And, and so with, all these things start to stack up, and the Lord says that he's not going to give us more than we can bear Man, it, it just seems like it's so much. What Dave was talking about, we get in situations where the Lord helps us and says, okay, you can't bear that alone. Please come to me. Another thing that, that makes trials so difficult in these storms is when they take place over a long period of time. I think under our own reserves, we, we can kind of handle situations and can kind of weather that storm and, oh, man, that was a terrible week. What if it goes on for day after day? It says this was a nonstop storm for 14 days. 14 days to tell you how bad it was. They didn't even have time to sit down and eat. They're just trying to hold the ropes together and, and, and keeping the rudder going. 14 days they've been at this, this panic crisis mode. What do you do when you go through a lengthy court battle that lasts for years? Or perhaps you've, you have, have been through an illness that just keeps going, a reoccurring illness, or, or you've been the, the spouse of someone going through that, and you're like, man, well, why didn't anyone ever ask about me? I know, I know they're the one in the hospital, but I'm the one that's having to do double duty to hold this family together. Or what about an ongoing addiction problem with a family member? It just snaps you, doesn't it? It just pulls everything out. And, and because these problems are not easily resolved, these storms, they, they take their toll. Another thing that, that takes your toll is when the storms can be prevented. You know, things that were going south, you know, Paul comes up, and, you know, after he sees this huge storm, you know, every, every time we read these things, we, we think they're having a, a casual conversation, but the storm is still going. So Paul comes up, and these guys are, are still in this crisis mode, so he has to yell to get their attention. And he says, man! You should have followed my advice and not to sail from Crete. I told you so. You know, you would have spared yourselves in this damage and loss. Isn't that great? 
You know, Paul, he's like, man, I'm bold. I, I told you guys, I, I got a connection with God. You don't, you should listen. Okay? How many messes and storms have you had to endure and clean up because people wouldn't listen to you? Maybe at work, you're like, okay, I told you. And now I've got to clean up your mess because you wouldn't listen and trust my judgment. Dad, I know he's your son, but I told you to stop loaning him money. Didn't I tell you not to marry her? She's been in trouble since day one. And these, these heartaches and these trials and these storms, it can rob you of your joy and your thanksgiving that quick if we think, man, if they just listen, this could have been prevented. What encouragement would Paul give us today? 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, then skipping down to 15, he says, we're hard-pressed on every side. <laughs> Life is not easy. But, you know, we're, we're not crushed. We're perplexed, not in despair. We're persecuted, but we haven't been abandoned. That's what we sang about. Lord, don't let go. You've been there with us. We've been struck down, but not destroyed. All of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow in the glory of God. What Paul is saying here is that you know, when we're focusing on these different things and we focus on what we have in Jesus, then these crisis moments that come up provide us an opportunity, don't they? An opportunity for us to look inward and say, Lord, what's going on? Or an opportunity for us to say, because I have this relationship with God and, and people are, are looking as to how I'm handling this, let me just tell you what the Lord has done to me and allow that to overflow with thanksgiving and joy in the midst of these trials. Paul said it's, it's a great opportunity. Well, the morning dawns, and the ship runs aground, and it just, the text says it just buries the bow deep into this sandbar. And as it does, the, the ship that was kind of being held together by ropes just starts breaking apart. And so you've you got the stern on the backside, and you've got these big waves that are crashing into it. And it says the, the ship just started coming, coming apart. So what happens is uh, the, the soldiers, they're, they're on board to prevent uh, their captors and, and these prisoners from, uh, from escaping. And amidst the chaos, they line up the, the prisoners, and they're about to, to take their lives. So their life won't be on the line. But there's a centurion that stepped forward. And he averts them carrying out their plans in order to save Paul because he had this connection with him. And so as the ship starts coming apart, it said each man just kind of grabbed a plank and started kicking and making their way to shore. And so you, you have this. And so they're, almost in this hex, you, you kind of go, Phew, Paul is safe. He's finally made it ashore. And, you know, the, the soldier didn't kill him. The storm didn't kill him. And now he's on dry land. And so he kind of, you can just see him kind of coming in from the surf and it's still kind of hitting him. And he gets up and he kind of dries off for a moment but then it says it's cold out and it's, it's raining you just kind of feel sorry for him kind of like a drowned dog out there and he, you feel sorry so Paul starts gathering up foot, uh, firewood to kind of uh, help those that are on shore and the, the text tells us that he builds a fire for everyone and yeah right as the flame gets going and the heat goes well a, a serpent comes out and bites him on the hand and <laughs> I think if I had been Paul, I'd be like, really, Lord? <laughs> the, the storm wasn't enough? Being in prison for two years wasn't enough? You know, I finally make it ashore and you send a snake? Lord, what's going on here? But that's not what Paul says. The third thief that can rob us of joy and thanksgiving is when we feel like our life has been snake bit. You know, have you been there? When you kind of feel like that your career is not what you thought it was going to be and you see some young bucks coming in that maybe are, are leapfrogging you and or maybe you got together at thanksgiving or christmas and you're going to see other family members and you start comparing notes and you start talking about investments you're like what investments i don't have any money to invest and so you, you start comparing some of these things you're like life has passed me by it is not what i thought and may, maybe you, you find a good company that, that you're working with and then suddenly they lose a contract from the government and you're like, okay, I was the last one in. Chances are I'm going to be the first one out when they downsize. Financially, sometimes you feel snake dick, like you just can't get ahead. 
you know, you, you finally get a little bit of money set aside, and then the air conditioning system goes out, and like, there's five grand I wasn't anticipating. And man, you're just like, Lord, please give me some relief here. Things just keep coming up to drain the bank account. Maybe relationally, you just can't find the right person. And you connect with someone for a while, then you find yourself just snake bit. You know, how do we remain thankful and, and joyful when those things happen? We just kind of feel like that the, the odds are stacked against you, and man, everything you put your hands to just come out with a viper attached to it. You know, they, these are some, some common thieves that, that can rob us of the joy and peace and, and thanksgiving that's supposed to just overflow from our lives. How do we shake that serpent off like, like Paul did? And how, how do we do that? What was Paul's solution? Well, the first is, when, when life goes off script from the way that we think it should go, then it kind of makes its way onto God's script. And we've got to trust that, amen? We have to, to think that God is going to put things in place. And even though we can't see what's around the corner, God's got a plan. And even though it, it seems like this is the most incredible pain, the, the hardest hardship that I've had to go through, we have to realize God has our best interests in mind. And he has a script that's so much better than what we could ever come up with. Because see, when we have life all planned out, sometimes it doesn't pan out. But when it doesn't, that's when we say, okay, Lord, I, I'm, I'm at the end. I don't have another sheet to look at. And Lord's like, thank you. I've been waiting. Come on. Here's the map I want you to follow. And I'm just going to give you one sheet at a time, one direction at a time. I don't want you to get too far ahead. I want you to trust me each and every day. You know, Paul knew that his Heavenly Father had a plan. He just asked him to trust and follow it. Way back in Acts chapter 23, when he's in prison, the Lord appeared to him and he says, Paul, just as you were bold in Jerusalem, and, and just as you were proclaiming my, my message there, he goes, I want you to proclaim that in Rome. That's big time. That's the center of the world. And, and the Lord says, Paul, if, if I don't put some things in place, you're going to stay here. I, I'm, I've got to change your course to get you to there. I know that's beyond what, what you can imagine, but that's my plan for you. So Paul finds himself on this ship, and the thing's rocking back and forth, and everyone else is fearful. I'm, we're not going to survive this. Paul's like going, we got this. Because I know what the Lord has revealed to me as to where I'm going. And, and this isn't the end of the story. So in Acts chapter 27, he says, I'm not going to buy into the idea that I'm lost at sea before the Lord delivers me on my promise. Acts 27 and verse 22 says, he talks to the guys and says, But now I urge you to keep up your courage, men, because not one of you is going to be lost. Only the ship's going to be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God in whom... Uh, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. <laughs> you must stand trial before Caesar. You're going to have your audience. And God has graciously given you and the lives of all you sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Do we spend time? I hope as we're going through cover to cover, you guys are making some mental uh, notes of promises of God you're spending time going is that really true yes and during these trials go back to these go back to promises he's given us and say Lord I, I, I'm going to hang my hat on that one and today I've got to hold on to this one because the winds are blowing and, and grab a hold of these promises because that's what Paul did in this situation so as he's doing this he declares his allegiance to God, come what may. The second piece of advice that, that Paul would give us is, when life goes through storms, praise him anyway. You know, just before dawn, this is an incredible scene. Right before the ship's about to break apart, he gets everyone together. He says, all, right, all the prisoners come up. And he goes, all your crewmen, you, you need to stop what you're doing. I, I know what's going to happen. And he tells them this. But once again, this is not a quiet conversation. So just imagine I'm being blown from side to side, and the waves are coming up, and, and you know, sea salt's coming in, and it's incredible. He says, for the last 14 days, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. 
I urge you to take some food. You're going to need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all, including this, this pagan audience that doesn't know his heavenly father. He broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. So in the midst of the storm, he just says, guys, we, we got this. God's got us right here. Now let's stop and eat. I know it doesn't make sense. The world would tell you, keep grabbing those ropes and keep doing everything under your power. Let those go. The text tells us they eventually cut the, the rigging down. They, they let the rudder go and just, okay, wherever this things go, we're, we're going to trust this God, Paul, that you're telling us about because we've tried to do it our way for 14 days and nothing's happened. Paul says, let it go. Let God have this. He's going to take care of you. And so they, they cut loose. They dropped what they were doing. They came over and ate bread to sustain themselves. And they broke bread in the presence of God. You know, just about anyone can praise the Lord if they so choose when it's out on the calm waters. What sets us apart as a people is when we can continue that praise, we can continue to do this when the waves start crashing. That's when it makes a difference. You know, that, that, that's the whole story of, of Job. Satan says he's a good guy. Well, the only reason he's good and the reason he's faithful, Lord, is because you've given him a great wife, a great family. He's wealthy, he's set. You start peeling some of these things back, he's going to be like every other man. You take away his wealth, take away his loving family, and take away his health and everything that he has, he's going to curse you. And of course, Job did not do that. So there stands Paul, the waves crashing over the bow and the cold driving rain, pelting him in the face, and he's breaking bread, giving thanks to his heavenly Father. The final thing he'd tell us is when life feels snake bit, live life to his glory. You know, his fellow prisoners and those on the island that were watching this whole snake bite incident, they could identify the snake as poisonous. And so they're all kind of watching, going, okay, this is only supposed to take a few minutes. So they're all kind of, okay, faces of death here. Let's watch and see what happens, you know. So they're all kind of watching him and waiting and waiting. I, I don't know. I. I imagine Paul's just like, he shakes it off, goes grab some more firewood, and keeps going. But they're, they're, they're waiting. And, and sure enough, the Lord delivers him, even though he's got this, this stuff coursing through his veins. How do you persevere? Paul would tell us in Philippians chapter 4, we, we read this earlier, in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He said, no matter what's going on, I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I, I know what it is to be in need, to not know where your next meal is coming from, and I know what it is to live in plenty. He said, I've, I've learned the secret of being content. And don't you know the people in, in Philippi are going, okay, what, what is it? What, what's that magical thing? He said, in any and every situation, whether I'm, I'm well-fed or I'm hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Once I was introduced to Jesus Christ, and I understand that this world is going to have hardships, but I'm living above that. I'm living in the spiritual realm. I realize what's happening in this life is going to be hard, but I know it's temporary. I know about what's to come. That's where my eyesight is. Because if I'm constantly focused on this, my eyes aren't on Jesus. Paul says, I'm completely on Jesus. If I live, great. If, if I die, great. I, I get to go be with Jesus. That's the mindset we have to get into. And it's hard to get there. But that's what he's calling us to. When Paul did not die, even with the poison going through him, the people thought that he was a god. He said, no, I'm not a god, but let me tell you about the god that I follow. Paul finally did make it to Rome and signaling to Luke's readers that this is not just some story that some of the locals, even Caesar, got to hear this story, and it made it all the way to Rome. So as he's doing this, Paul realized that God sent him on a mission. We're on mission as well, aren't we? We need to realize that. Doesn't no matter what's going on in life, we don't have time to fret. We don't have time to complain. And we don't have time to, to second-guess God's plans for our life. Our mission is way too important. Let, let's pray together. Lord, I, I hope that we do realize that we're on mission. 
I, I hope that, that you will convict us in our heart that what's going on in this world is just temporary. Lord, I know that there are some that are dealing with physical ailments that are all-consuming, either in their life or life of a spouse. I pray for them, and I want to lift them up. Lord, it's so hard for them to have joy and thanksgiving and even peace within a marriage when they're struggling with these things, and that becomes all that their life is around is an illness. I pray that you can give them relief, but also pray that, that you can help them to redirect that focus onto you. Paul says, man, I've got this thorn in the flesh, but every time I think of it, Lord, I, I, I replace that thought with thinking about you. Lord, that song that we sang today, never once did we walk alone. You're faithful. God, you're faithful. May we breathe out your praise no matter what happens in this life. Lord, I, I thank you for Dave and the group that was able to go up and, and help those uh, in Sandy. Lord, those that, that's lives were totally turned upside down by the hurricane. But Lord, I ask you to help them spiritually. I, I pray for the work that was done, but also pray for seeds that were planted. Lord, help us to be on task and realize that it's not about our comfort, our safety, or what we have or what we don't have. Lord, it's all about being on mission and proclaiming the gospel message to any audience that you will open the door for. Lord, help us to focus our lives on that. In Jesus' name, amen.